Thank you all for joining us this afternoon uh, for another Talks at Google event. We're very thrilled to have Allison Bing from Lonely Planet uh, to speak to us today about high-impact travel. Um, she's the author of over 45 books for Lonely Planet, um, specifically for us locally here, the San Francisco, Coastal California ones, among others. And so she'll talk about her experiences writing uh, for Lonely Planet. And when she's not doing that, she also um, helps Google out with our, our brand studio and works and writes for several other publications nationwide as well. So uh, please join me in welcoming Allison to Google. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. So um, we're going to be talking a little bit today about um, high impact travel. We, as, as you know, um, you can't, uh, by the time you arrive in an airplane, you already have a huge carbon footprint to offset. And, um, and travel is more satisfying when it's a positive exchange because nobody likes to be a burden or show up empty handed. Um, when a friend invites you to dinner, you just automatically ask what you can bring and making that contribution feels really good. So when you travel to an unfamiliar place, you don't even know who to ask um, what you could bring. Uh, showing up with nothing to offer gets things started on the wrong foot. You've already got that carbon footprint to think about. Um, and it feels like a lopsided transaction. It's a drain on local resources. And it feels awkward. So to make a positive impression, sometimes we show up with a kind of a token gift um, a San Francisco Giants t-shirt, maybe. Um, Three-time World Series champions, you know? Well, neither did my Lonely Planet editor in London. He was not very impressed. He was like, baseball? We have cricket. <laughs> so, um, yeah. It went over better in uh, a Moroccan village in the High Atlas Mountains, where I brought a t-shirt. Uh, and it was promptly torn up into strips and woven into a rug. So it's not what I pictured, but you know, OK. Um, but it was a terrible flop in Italy, where um, the horrified Italian friend I gave it to uh, gave me a lecture saying, you need to, you Americans need to make your t-shirts fit more tightly. And he was like, for the sake of humanity, you know, fix your fashion. So uh, I learned the hard way. But you know, as a travel writer, that's my job. I make mistakes so that you don't have to make them. So don't bring the t-shirts. Um, bring something else. Bring something more meaningful. Like what? So I'm glad you asked. The first thing you can bring is suitcase space. So travelers often pride themselves on traveling light, but they're missing out on an opportunity to connect with people in their destination. Because carrying just a little extra weight is a small but tangible act of kindness that creates powerful bonds. And there are two important things you probably have room for in your suitcase. One is specific supplies or in-kind donations for a destination nonprofit. Be sure to ask what that nonprofit needs most. Um, you know, don't assume that San Francisco Giants t-shirts or Google swag or whatever you happen to have on hand is going to be welcome, especially if you don't have enough to go around. This is a, uh, an orphanage that I visited in Ethiopia and um, uh, definitely didn't need um, San Francisco Giants t-shirts, but donations were most welcome. Um, last summer, when I was invited to work on a public awareness campaign for the Ethiopian Midwives Association, I asked what hospital supplies might be helpful. They asked me to bring pediatric breathing tubes which are inexpensive here, but really hard to come by there. And they're essential to rescue newborns with respiratory problems. At the time, I was working at Apple. Um, and when I told colleagues there that what I was doing, they wanted, me to, they wanted to send tubes too. So I found out the maximum number I could carry, and I weighed my luggage to the last ounce. And all those tubes have been put to use already. And let me say, not one of those was woven into a rug. In fact, they were used by the doctors you see in this photo. This is um, a birth ceremony that I was invited to attend in Ethiopia. And if I look a little awkward, it's because I had a terrible cold that day. And I was trying not to touch anything to make the baby sick. But the doctor said, don't worry, you know, you're fine. It'll be good for the antibodies for the baby. So there you go. 
doctors. Um, here's something you're probably already doing. Uh, tell colleagues and friends where you're going and ask that people who lived in that area if you could take them for coffee or lunch uh, to get their suggestions. So far, that's mostly benefiting you, right? But at lunch, if there's anything they might like you to deliver to their friends or family while you're there, ask. Nothing huge, just mementos, photos, letters, maybe a birthday gift for a kid, and deliver it in person. This is a really meaningful gesture. Many people with family abroad can't get away for visits very often. And many people are concerned about re-entry to the US right now. Even if your colleague or friend says, no thanks, they won't forget your kindness. This is a photo of the inside of a guest house where I stayed in Ethiopia. And the, these are items that previous guests had sent to the host. She had a thing for baskets and tinware and tea sets and had some from all over. Um, I brought her Benadryl because she had allergies and um, was really suffering from high pollen counts while I was there. And uh, she liked the Benadryl. And I'm invited back. So that worked. If they do give you a memento to deliver, that's a great way to make new friends or instant relatives in an unfamiliar place. When my best friend was living in Zimbabwe, a guy she was dating visited San Francisco. And he brought me a bundle of letters from my friend and a colleague, a collage he had made about a trip they took together. Smart move. That's one way to win the approval of your girlfriend's best friend. They're now married. And as their friend, I had the honor of being the justice of the peace at their wedding ceremony. That's me right there. That's them. OK, so your suitcase is fully loaded. Nice. Now what else can you bring? Research skills. So wild assumption here. I'm guessing you know how to search online, probably better than anyone on the planet. So I'm about to tell you something that you already know, especially all you product people. Um, to maximize positive impact, you must do advanced research. Um, before you even buy a ticket, research to figure out where you want to go, where you want to stay, what you want to eat, what you want to do, and use impact as a filter. And pro tip here, Lonely Planet flags hotels, restaurants, sites, stores, bars, and other venues with a proven commitment to sustainability. In our books, just look for the leaf icon. OK, so maybe you don't want a power search on your day off. I get that. But don't count on just showing up and asking a local for pointers. In Venice, locals often complained to me that tourists were always asking them for directions. At first, I thought they were exaggerating until I did the math. Even if every tourist asked for directions only once, each Venetian would be asked, on average, three times a day. And Venetian directions are complicated. There are hundreds of footbridges and canals. It takes time to answer, and that gets to be an imposition. So I made sure our Lonely Planet Venice maps were really thorough. And I also encouraged tourists to consider getting lost part of the adventure. Um, I like to think maybe some Venetians are being asked for directions only twice a day now. And here you can see some of the difficulty that Google Maps is up against with satellite imagery, trying to show where streets end in Venice. But you know, we walk those routes. Um, also, when you do get information from a local, say thanks, then stealthily fact check that information. Even with the best intentions, some locals will cheerfully give you the wrong information. Has this happened to you? OK. Um, they assume they know all the best places in their town, but the truth is we get a lazy in our backyards. We're comfortable here. We can't always be tracking sustainable restaurant practices or nonprofit initiatives, especially when it's sunny out. Oh, by the way, these guys are the proud owners of a Lonely Planet leaf icon. They have um, practiced sustainable fishing. 
uh, support sustainable fishing. They serve exclusively Venetian food. It's El Arco in Venice. And that's Francesco and his son Matteo behind him. Quite a team. I interviewed them. That's how I know their names. Otherwise, I'm usually incognito. So I know all too well the problem of potentially um, overlooking something in your own backyard. I think I know my city of San Francisco until I set out to write the Lonely Planet Guide to San Francisco. And it turns out I know my neighborhood pretty well, and I know the paths I take to and from work. Everything else requires intensive research. So I Google search like crazy. I interview people. I visit places. I uncover through research. Um, eavesdrop heavily. I'm listening. If you're in that restaurant with me, I'm probably trying to hear whether or not you're liking your food. Um, and I ask questions of everyone I meet at a destination. For example, recent research indicated that many diners were complaining about a newish restaurant in San Francisco called Cala that for adding a flat 20% service fee. So I went to Cala Incognito to eat dinner there, and I asked people there about it. Um, my server was especially glad I asked her directly because it's important to her, and she feels it's been misconstrued online. I hear that kind of thing can happen. Um, turns out that their fixed service fee is part of a city program to rehabilitate people who have been incarcerated for nonviolent crimes, usually drug related, ensuring a consistent income so that they can get back on their feet and stick with substance abuse treatment programs. The story checks out. So now I can eat a Kella, and I will because it's that good, uh, and I can feel good about that service fee, and I can recommend it to you in good conscience. So you've filled your luggage. You've done your research to figure out where you can have an impact without entirely leaving it up to locals to educate you. This is all good, but there's something else you may be able to offer. A willingness to go the extra mile or 30. Every dollar you spend in rural areas is circulated through the community four to 10 times more than in cities. This is something we discovered when I was at Airbnb. The traveler's economic impact in rural areas is exponential. But looking at travel industry data, we also discovered that most people don't venture more than two hours beyond city limits. That's a lost opportunity for rural areas, but it's our loss as travelers too. We're missing out on some really enriching experiences in absolutely beautiful places. Sometimes these places are not set up for travelers, so you have to do extra research to find out where to stay, what to do, and what to eat. This is a first communion that we stumbled into in Kampala, Copala, Mexico, um, and we're invited to participate. And it's just a few hours outside of Mazalan, about two and a half. And by the way, this previous image as well, two and a half hours from Rome. It's a town of Sorano in Tuscany. So not everybody can do this extra bit of research, but you can because you are Google. So look, I'm not saying it's easy. Um, once I was assigned by Lonely Planet to find sustainable tourism options in the remote Aipu Gomez Valley in Morocco's High Atlas Mountains. Previous editions of Lonely Planet Morocco mentioned that it was a beautiful uh, place, ideal for hiking, but it sounded kind of scary. Uh, roads washed out, food could be scarce, and few people spoke European languages or Arabic. By then, I had already seen one San Francisco Giants t-shirt torn to shreds, so I knew I had to do my research before I came. So I hired a Tashel hit speaking guy from the area with a four-wheel drive car, and together we visited villages carved out of cliff faces. We asked people and village elders, what do you do here? What would you like people to know about this place? Are there talents or skills you'd like to share? And I asked them all the same question we're trying to answer today. If people would like to repay your hospitality, 
How can they best do that? Working in this collaborative way with villagers we met along the valley, we were able to find ways to support initiatives they'd had in the works for years. By the time we left the valley, there were working models in place for an after-school tea program at a center for disabled adults in Demnat. There was a postcard pen pal project to support language acquisition for eco-trekking guides in Tabant. And there were goat cheese tastings with a women's goat herd collective, which they started against the will of their parents, by the way. Six years later, these programs are all flourishing. Travelers' financial support and overwhelmingly positive social media posts have helped expand accessibility for disabled people in the valley and created new jobs through eco-travel. The Women's Goat Cheese Cooperative has tripled in size and received international slow food prizes for their cheese. Roads have even improved, much to the relief of the local donkeys. And that's the thing about sustainable travel. It's not as difficult as you might think to be a trailblazer. All I needed to do was go a bit further out of my way and ask a few more questions than I typically ask. And when more people go further and ask more, we can all accomplish even more. It's exponential. Here's how I know that. Last time I was in, in Morocco, I ran a work session with Peace Corps volunteers to identify ways to involve travelers in local development efforts. They brought it back to their communities who held their own work sessions. Morocco is also the biggest Peace Corps site in the Middle East, and that information has now been shared with sites across the Middle East. I also got a lot out of it. Turns out that sustainable travel road trips are totally bonding experiences. <laughs> Mohammed Noor, the colleague who accompanied me as a driver and translator, is now a friend of mine for life. And as the result of our travels, he's moved to the Ibogomes Valley. He started his own eco-travel business and now trains and mentors eco-travel guides. Like I said, exponential impact. Okay, so now you've got a full suitcase. You've done your research on impact. You're ready to go further and ask more. Excellent. I can almost feel your exponential impact coming. Almost. There's one more thing you can bring with you. A passion or a belief that transcends borders. This could be a big idea like net neutrality or refugee support or a vision to end human trafficking. That guy on the lower left is my Google brand studio colleague, Ruben Santa. Hi, Ruben. Um, who joined a team of eight Googlers in Nepal for a 20% project with effet.org to fight human trafficking. They met with girls in safe houses who had escaped slavery and are now studying, learning vocational skills, and becoming advocates for girls still in captivity. Ruben and the Google team use their everyday problem solving skills to support some of the NGOs making an impact on the ground. I asked Ruben to describe the impact of the trip on him personally, and he answered me with this photo. Another Google Brand Studio coworker, Ryan Chen, just came back from a 20% project with NetHope, an organization that sets up Wi-Fi at refugee camps in Greece. This is a camp inside a departure hall in Greece um, for Afghan refugees. Between interviewing refugees, he would decompress by drawing. People started looking over his shoulder and asking if he would draw them. That's Ryan in the middle. So he started sharing his pictures with people around him, people living in tents who had almost nothing, but they had rations. And because it's human nature to reciprocate, he was invited for tea. So Ryan drew even more pictures and his hosts shared even more of their stories with him. And this is Mustafa holding one of Ryan's drawings. 
Ryan graciously allowed me to share some of his pictures with you today so that you can start to get to know refugees as he did. And maybe some of you will want to volunteer with NetHope and install more routers in more refugee camps. I wish I could draw like Ryan, but I can't. My passions are simpler, like corn. I was raised in a corn growing country in Indiana, and two big upsides of humid Hoosier summers were one, diving into limestone quarry pools, and two, corn on the cob. Turns out quarry jumping is kind of dangerous and technically illegal, and tasty corn is getting harder to find. In the 1980s, most farms in my county were bought out by agribusiness, and now the corn in my county is the kind used for cattle feed and those compostable takeout boxes. But when harvest time comes around, I still crave corn. So I did my research to find out where farmers still grow tasty heirloom corn, like the kind I ate as a kid. The answer Google gave me, Oaxaca, Mexico. OK, Google, so how do I get to that corn? Turns out Global Exchange was organizing a trip to Oaxaca for Day of the Dead. I don't go for organized trips. It's my job to organize other people's trips. But Global Exchange does fantastic research tracking food justice initiatives. The itinerary they suggested included visits to a taqueria that exclusively uses rare varietals of corn. They have 33 different corns on that menu. And this is an image from Day of the Dead. This young woman is dressed in a dress made entirely of corn husks and corn kernels. You can see some of the different colors of the heirloom corn that is grown in Oaxaca. But even more importantly, the trip introduced me to Zapotec farmers who started seed corn, bank, seed corn banking to preserve heirloom varietals. When I got a whiff of that corn cooking, I thought, yeah, this, I get it. This is food worth fighting for, and this is food worth saving for future generations. So thank you, Google. I finally found that corn I've been craving, but I also found my new food heroes. Now back to you. Already you have a full suitcase, solid background research on sustainable travel, an itinerary with a rural area where you're planning to ask bonus questions, and a passion you're ready to pursue to the ends of the earth. But there is one last thing you can share, the thing that Google shares every day. You know this one. Information. Um, and this is a, an Italian muralist. It says, um, uh, let's all give each other a hand. Um, so as part of the application to join that global exchange trip to Oaxaca, they asked me what I was going to do with the information I gathered and stories I heard. Well, here I am telling you about it. So that's one promise I've kept today. But there are other ways to circulate information. You know the drill. Write posts. Host Wikipedia hack days to correct misinformation and add to our global knowledge about remote places that may not have access to information sharing directly. Ruben put together this crowdfunding campaign for effect.org, and he whizzed past his goal. Um, but I promised him I'd say this. You can still donate and volunteer with effect.org. So Ruben, that's another promise I've kept today. Or you can do what Ryan did and volunteer to install Wi-Fi for people who really need it. This boy drew his family a house with the crayons Ryan brought. Notice it has a NetHope Wi-Fi access point. Join no networks with the people you meet. Widen the circle to make room for people to be heard and get to know each other. You'll learn stuff, including some really random facts about breathing tubes and goat cheese, and you'll make friends for life. And one day, after all this travel, you may be invited to hang out with people whose work you sincerely admire, people you've been meaning to thank for a while. And you won't have to show up empty-handed or wind up bringing t-shirts no one wants. You'll have some information they might actually be able to use to help them make their next trip more meaningful. This just happened to me. 
Next time, it's your turn. Let's make this exponential. One last thing. I'm headed to Uganda next month to work on a cervical cancer awareness campaign. So if you have family or friends in Uganda, I'd like to take you, for lunch, you out for lunch. And when I offer to deliver a memento to your friends and family in Uganda, you know I mean it. Thank you. Tying with the, the message that you said and how it relates to the creation of the books, you know, the, the idea to go one, you know, 10, 10 extra miles down the road and, yeah. and you know, how, do, how do you balance that with, um, you know, how now everybody's going 10 extra miles down the road and they're all selling, um, you know, specialty um, heirloom corn and, you know, how, how do you, you know, not, not overwhelm and keep pushing the frontiers right. uh, when you suggest that people go places? Well, the, the other part of that um, going further is asking more. Right? So you don't just go for the corn. Um, you meet the farmers, and then you ask the farmers what, what else is happening in the communities. And suddenly, some of the slides I didn't put in here, they say, well, you know, uh, I like to do woodwork in my spare time. Oh, do you know? And it turns out that you know, the farmers um, in this village where I went for the corn, let's be honest, um, have fantastic, I mean, it, it, it's a, Surprised it's not sort of UNESCO acclaimed or preserved. It's just a matter of time, really. But it's um, uh, farmers have been doing woodworking in that area for hundreds of years now and donating it to the local church. So the woodworking is splendid, right? So you just keep asking more people and you say, oh, well, is it anybody else making interesting food or doing something interesting in their spare time? And they will point you towards the next village and they will point you towards the you know, their cousin across the valley who makes this really interesting corn drink fermented that's uh, more powerful than you expect. <laughs> that was tasty, but strong. So yeah, just keep continuing, use your curiosity to keep, to keep pushing past the limits. And it doesn't, it, it certainly, it doesn't take a journalistic background to do that. Um, it just takes your sort of natural, um, the curiosity that you apply every work every day at work here uh, to your travel. Thank you for presenting. It's oh, great hey. to hear your information and Thanks. how to do it. How do you manage the language barriers or differences to really getting in and understanding the culture and meeting the people who may not speak the languages that you do? Yeah. So it, it, it is helpful to do some, some language learning before you, before you go if you can, especially if you know you're going to be going to remote areas. But there's nothing preventing anyone from hiring a, a, a local translator or guide. I mean, there are fixers who are, who are used to this kind of thing um, who you can hire as an independent traveler. Um, I just lucked out that you know, when I was referred to a, a series of, of uh, translators, um, somebody said, well, this guy is really more of a geologist. And I said, aha. Because I knew the area that we were going to um, was, you know, this this is known for um, uh, having prehistoric uh, fossil sites, and I knew that I would want to like, see what other types of information I could get out of him as a local expert. So it's trying to find, you know, trying to see if you can double up. Can the person who's taking you someplace? also provide you with some additional language learning? Do they have insights from their own interests or careers or background that they can bring to that, that story for you? Um, and also, you know, again, because you don't want to rely on locals to give you all this information, triangulate. Um, see if you can make connections with uh, places that you're going. So instead of saying, OK, take me to wherever's important, and then somebody takes you just to the one famous mosque in town. And meanwhile, you're passing right by this phenomenal you know, school where, in Demnat where, they, um, where adults are doing vocational training and, and lifelong learning and offering tea to passersby. You know? So um, if you don't leave it entirely up to your local expert, but find it, try to make some local contacts and find some information about where you're headed. Um, Demnat also turns out, in addition to having this phenomenal school, um, 
It is renowned for its olive oil and a particular type of couscous, which remains to this day, like I dream about that couscous. <laughs> so uh, you, if, if you do your own kind of background research, historical research, you may come across things that even, even locals don't know. Yeah. One, one last question then. Um, so what, what, what determines something that you choose to, to put in the guidebook versus leaving out of the guidebook? Mm -hmm. Well, we do, we do consider paths also. Um, uh, we're aware, uh, particularly in, in destinations like Morocco, where people can be um, uh, depend on a guidebook a lot because um, it's a, a key source of information. Uh, San Francisco, there's a lot of information available readily online. Um, not so much in the kind of outer reaches of the Sahara Desert. So, um, uh, but you have to be mindful um, as a travel writer to constantly be checking and shifting so that one, you know, you're not enriching the one merchant in town who happens to sell water who's in the book. Is there somebody else also selling water? <laughs> you know, probably. Can you say, oh, along this, this particular block, there are several people who sell, sell water. So you want to be mindful of not um, having an undue impact on a, um, on a remote community. Uh, and again, like continuing every time to check, see what's going on, see how that money is being spent. You know, is it, is it being, um, is the, the community seeing the benefit or is it really just that one water seller? Um, we had a, there's a, a story in Morocco, um, there is an oasis that gets bypassed because it's not along, a, you know, a, a side road was built, a bigger road was built. And so now this town that is a, a bit historic, Agdes, has been um, completely bypassed. And uh, I thought, hmm, I want to I wanna find out what's going on there. <laughs> and I had done some, some research with nonprofits. And they said, yeah, there's a, there's a community garden that's opened up there. I'm not really sure what they're up to. But you know, if you, if you like gardens, and I knew that um, uh, um, English folks who are a big audience for, for Lonely Planet guidebooks are really passionate about gardening. I thought, I better check out the garden. So I went, and it turns out that it's a communally organized garden that was started um, by some school teachers who noticed that kids were falling asleep in class um, and were not growing very much. And they realized uh, that it connected with malnourishment. They weren't getting enough of a range of nutrients to support them uh, in their development. And uh, so the community got together and they said, look, we've got this patch of land at the center. We've got one well in town. Maybe we can um, agree to uh, send some of the, irrigate that one patch that doesn't belong to any one person and all grow vegetables together and agree that this is going to be for the families who need it most and then if there's leftover, then it goes to the, to the other families. And then if there's, you know, they, they couldn't actually imagine a time when there would be leftover after that. Um, so I met with them and I said, you know, can people come and visit your garden without disrupting your gardening? Uh, and they said, sure, any time. And I was like, OK, well, actually, it's possible you would get a lot of people interested in this garden. So let's, let's set some times and let's set a meeting place and let's figure out who's going to be able to let them in and show them around. Um, so they, they thought I was clearly, they were like, well, this is just a garden that we've started in our village. I mean, I'm like, ah, I can't imagine tourists really want to see it, but okay. Um, and the next time I came, they said, I, first of all, the garden had grown. Second of all, the children had grown <laughs> and were paying attention in class. They had, um, a, they had diverse, been able to diversify what they were growing from simple sort of beans and root vegetables, they were able to grow tomatoes. They were selling them now to other villages. So they were able to buy books for the school as well. So it had this huge knock-on effect. And it was all individual travelers coming through saying, hey, um, we had provided a, um, uh, a range saying, you know, if you want to plant one row of beans, you could leave a donation of like $5. And that would do that for this community. And people were crazy generous. And you know, we're like, well, 
we, we want you to be able to, to grow as much food as your community needs. Um, and, uh, and so they were very moved by that. The next time I came back, they said, OK, so this is great. Our, our community is doing well. We're able to help out neighboring villages to, to pilot similar projects. And they said, but one thing we never realized, we never thought of ourselves as environmental leaders. And, and we've had people come to us from, from you know, visitors from not just from the UK, but from Bangladesh, from Latin America, from all these other places, saying, we could do this in the place that I'm from. Do you mind if I borrow this idea? And very open source. <laughs> They're like, yes, we'll tell you how to do it. We'll tell you how to scale it. We now have expertise to offer, right? We can, we can help you model this. So that all happened just because there was, you know, I, I was thinking actually of our users. I was thinking of British people being interested in gardens. And in, in fact, it had this tremendous impact. Um, uh, and that's something that anybody could do. It doesn't have to be. Um, you all have a phenomenal platform, um, and you invent new platforms all the time. <laughs> so thinking creatively about how you can um, support an effort that is ongoing, like that's 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 just what you do at Google. Um, you you think about users all the time. So if you think about uh, your travel the same way, what can you do? What small thing can you do? What platform can you provide? Um, it's, a, it's a powerful tool. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Cliff.